Today, we'll be discussing the disappearance of one Alicia Ross, which occurred in 2005 in Ontario, Canada. This case quickly became one of the most high-profile disappearances Ontario had seen. Her purse, phone, and documents remain untouched in her bedroom, and only the mess in the backyard aroused suspicion. Alicia had no reason to run away. She wouldn't have left without informing anyone, so the police soon suspected foul play was involved in this case. Alicia was born on February 8, 1980, in Markham, Ontario, Canada. Sharon Fortas and Marvin Ross adopted her as a baby. They adored her. She had big blue eyes and blonde hair. Sharon and Marvin later separated and began new relationships, but they all remained close. In 2005, Alicia was 25 years old. She was enjoying life and looking forward to her future. After graduating, she spent a year in Australia before returning home to Markham, which lies north of Toronto. Sharon described Alicia as an adorable baby, a precious toddler, a blossoming preteen, and a terrible, terrible teenager. In the summer of 2005, Alicia was doing what she loved most. She was camping in northern Ontario. She loved spending time in nature, far from the hustle and bustle of the city. It was a wonderful summer, and none of her friends and family could have imagined that this summer would be the last of Alicia's life. Alicia lived with her mom, Sharon Fortas, and her new husband, Julius. Alicia stayed in the basement of their home, where she had a separate entrance. In this way, the basement became like her own house. On August 16th, Alicia and Sharon went for a dog walk in Pomona Mills Park. Alicia shared some exciting news with her mother. She was due to be promoted the next day at her sales job at Hewlett Packard, and she couldn't wait to go to work to have the news confirmed. In addition to doing well professionally, Alicia was also happy with her personal life. She'd been dating a man called Sean Hine for a month, and things looked promising. After that walk in the park, Alicia went to meet Sean. They played pool and spent time together at Alicia's place. Sean left shortly before midnight. When he got home, he called Alicia to tell her he had got home safely, but there was no response. It was no cause for concern as it was already late and Sean thought she might be asleep. He called her again the following morning, but there was still no answer. Sean started to worry. He was even more worried when he discovered that Alicia didn't show up for work that morning. On the night Alicia was with Sean, Sharon went to bed very early, so she didn't hear anything happening in the basement or in the backyard. It's a move she'll come to regret forever. I never go to bed early, she recalled later. It was just that one night. In the morning, Sharon and her husband Julius planned to go to a golf tournament. When they left the house, Sharon noticed that Alicia's car was still in the driveway. She thought it was strange, but she didn't think to check on why her daughter didn't go into work that morning. Unable to reach Alicia, Sean contacted the police. It was Sean who first reported her missing. He also called Sharon, who was at the golf course, and told her that he was unable to get a hold of Alicia. Sean told police that the last time he saw his girlfriend was that night on the side of the road near her mother's house. Sean told them they were spending time in her room, and then she had walked him to his car and they'd said their goodbyes. That was the last time he saw her. When Sharon returned home, Sean was there with the police. He was very nervous and didn't know what to do. Sharon looked around her daughter's room and found that her keys, documents, and purse were still there. Everything in the room was as it usually was. However, when Sharon looked at Alicia's bed, she realized that no one had slept there that night. Also, there was something strange in the backyard. The gate was open. A cigarette, a glass, and sandals were laid out on the grass in a straight line that led to the open gate. All these details indicated that Alicia had disappeared under suspicious circumstances. After starting the investigation, the police focused on Sean, Alicia's boyfriend. He was the last person to see her, and he was the one who reported her missing. Investigators needed to find out if Sean was involved in Alicia's disappearance or if he had nothing to do with it. Sean was 29 years old at the time, and as already mentioned, he and Alicia had been dating for about a month. It seemed that everything was going smoothly in their relationship. Sharon Fortas claimed that her daughter had absolutely no reason to leave. Besides, Alicia was looking forward to a promotion at work. After she disappeared, Sean looked depressed. 
He said that he loved Alicia. He hoped she was fine and would return home soon. Sean was a person of interest to investigators, but they needed to find out where Alicia was and what happened to her before accusing him of anything. If he was telling the truth, it meant Alicia had disappeared between midnight and sunrise. The following day, August 18th, the police conducted a search with service dogs in a helicopter. They checked the area where Alicia lived, but could not find any leads that would help with the investigation. Sean was one of many who participated in the search. Stung by the suspicions, Sean emotionally appealed for information about her whereabouts. Look at these pictures, he said, rifling through some recent photos that show a smiling Alicia. This is from last weekend in Quebec on the Rouge River, okay? You can understand how happy we were. This is… this is breaking my heart, he concluded with his voice shaking. I loved her. The police appealed to the public through the media to join the search for Alicia. The reaction was overwhelming. Hundreds of volunteers expressed a desire to join the search for the missing young woman. It was one of the biggest missing person searches in Ontario history. People put missing persons posters on poles and distributed them to drivers. Bad weather hindered the search, and despite all the efforts, they found nothing. We've searched a number of areas, greenbelt areas, ravines, and things of that nature in the immediate area south of the 407 highway to Steeles Avenue, and on the east, we've searched over to the 404, and to the west, we've searched Bayview Avenue, said Inspector Craig Rogers. There has been no evidence of Alicia anywhere in that area at this point in time. After this story appeared on the news, the police received hundreds of messages from the public. However, it took time to check on them all. On August 20th, four days after Alicia's disappearance, her parents decided to speak publicly. With red eyes and a trembling voice, Alicia's mother, Sharon, looked into the camera with a desperate plea for information about her daughter. With great courage, she uttered a message to her absent child. Alicia, I've never broken a promise to you, and I promise you, you will come home soon, she vowed. Then, addressing the public, she added, I beg you to come forward. I wish no harm to anyone, just the safe return of my daughter. Sharon believed that Alicia had been kidnapped and was being held captive. Investigators had their own ideas, one of which was that Alicia had been abducted by someone she knew. Alicia had a lot of friends and knew most of the people in the neighborhood. After all, she grew up there. Judging by the situation in her room, she was going to go to bed, but then, for unknown reasons, went outside. There were no signs of a struggle or illegal entry into the room. That's why investigators believe that if it really was a kidnapping, then it was done by someone she knew and trusted. The number of these ideas grew every day. The police checked all messages received from the public, but after a week of searching, there were no results. The search area expanded daily, but the results were the same. The police still had no idea where Alicia had gone or why. On August 22nd, the sixth day after her disappearance, the police finally said the words that everyone was thinking about, foul play. Although there is no evidence to suggest foul play, and the lack of evidence, we are concentrating on the possibility that foul play may exist and be responsible for her disappearance, said Inspector Tom Carrick. Despite the dismal forecasts, Alicia's family tried to remain optimistic. We love her, and we'll be seeing her soon. And she's a strong, bright, intelligent woman, and she's going to be home. She'll be home soon, said Randy Fortis, Alicia's stepsister. The police command post at a nearby school remained in place, but the police decided to scale back the search and focus their investigation on Sean. He was the last person to see Alicia alive, and the investigators believed his story was somewhat suspicious. It was strange that he reported his girlfriend missing to the police before contacting her family. Why was Sean so confident she was missing? Perhaps he knew that for sure. Maybe they had a fight that night. Sean was depressed and didn't really want to talk to reporters. He lived alone in Richmond Hill, about 10 miles from Alicia's house. After realizing the police considered him a suspect, Sean distanced himself from the search. Journalists waited outside Sean's home with cameras, and he undoubtedly didn't like it. Investigators questioned him several times about Alicia's disappearance, but his version remained unchanged. He insisted that he had told the truth. He said he had no idea why or under what circumstances she disappeared. He refused the offer to take a polygraph test. Alicia's mother admitted that she didn't know Sean that well. 
She couldn't say anything bad about him because her daughter seemed happy with him. According to Alicia's family, she didn't have any enemies. Therefore, they didn't know who would have motive to harm her. On August 23rd, one week after Alicia's disappearance, police searched her Toyota Corolla. Why they waited a week to do this remains unclear, but the police refused to say what exactly they were looking for there. On the same day, a surprising news story spread throughout the city, which caused a lot of stir among the residents. But what had happened was not what everyone had assumed. In a strange twist, in an already bizarre case, the police arrested Sean Hine. However, it wasn't related to Alicia's disappearance. He was arrested for drunk driving. Sean was detained overnight, and his driver's license was suspended for 90 days. With no other leads, the police turned their attention back to Sean. Investigators talked to his neighbors. They wanted to know if they had seen anything suspicious in the last week. Perhaps someone saw him putting garbage bags in front of his house. Or maybe they saw him cleaning his car's interior or trunk. The police searched the area around Sean's house, but none of this helped to find Alicia, or even give them some new leads. A month after the disappearance, Alicia's story stopped making headlines. Alicia's family waited for her return, and police officials were doing everything possible to solve the case. More than a month later, after hundreds of tips were pursued, investigators finally got a major break in the case. But it was not the outcome anyone wanted. The man who lived right next door called the police and, with the help of a lawyer, surrendered himself. 31-year-old Daniel Sylvester, a recluse who lived with his mother, said he was responsible for Alicia's disappearance and death, but claimed it was an accident. The Fortis family barely knew their neighbors, and Sharon said she had only seen Daniel Sylvester a few times. Daniel was never once suspected of being involved in Alicia's disappearance. He hadn't even been considered. Therefore, it was unlikely that the police would have arrested him at this stage if he had not come to the police station himself. Sylvester said that when he realized Alicia was dead, he put her in the trunk and drove to Manila, Ontario, where he hid her in the bushes by the side of a back road. This place was about an hour's drive from her home in Markham. But three weeks later, with the police search well underway, he returned to the place where he had left Alicia and transported her remains to Kobukonk. There, he hid them near his family's property, where they had a cottage. With public suspicions focused on Sean Hine, Alicia's boyfriend and the last known person to have seen her before she disappeared, the news that her next-door neighbor, an enigmatic and little-known character on his street, had been arrested, shocked the city. Toronto Sun columnist Mike Strobel wrote an apology piece to Sean Hine on behalf of a presumptuous public. The police found the remains in the place indicated by Sylvester. The examination confirmed that these were in fact the remains of Alicia Ross. Alicia's body was too decomposed to determine how she died. However, Dr. Catherine Grusbier, a forensic pathologist, described her injuries as something typically seen in victims of fatal car or plane crashes. Sylvester told York police he slapped Alicia across the face with his right hand after they suddenly encountered each other in the grassy pathway between their upscale homes. He then advanced on her and pinned her to the ground, trying to incapacitate her as she fought back and clawed at his hair. Defense attorney David Hobson maintained, as did Sylvester, that he exploded into rage after Alicia called him a loser, a degrading phrase that triggered pent-up anger from years of peers laughing and mocking him for being a social misfit. He finally lashed out when Alicia swore at him, deciding he had had enough. Alicia Ross sustained at least 33 fractures to her body including most of her 24 ribs, when Sylvester threw her to the ground and drilled his right knee into her upper chest several times, before grabbing her hair and slamming the back of her head repeatedly to the ground, opening a wound at the back of her head that bled profusely. She had a broken breastbone in the middle, as well as several fractured neck vertebrae. She also suffered a broken nose and a cracked cheekbone on the right side of her face, the opposite side to which Sylvester claimed he struck her. According to Sylvester, after he realized that Alicia was dead, he dragged her into his garage and stripped her naked to the waist, telling police it was because he didn't want people to get the wrong idea of how her clothes became torn. He also said that he pleasured himself to relieve tension. Then he put her in the trunk of his car, took a shower, and changed his clothes. He left the city and dumped her body in a field south of Manila. 
He then threw out trash bags with some of Alicia's clothes, his soiled clothes, including two pairs of jeans stained with his seminal fluid, as well as towels with which he wiped his traces of the crime scene. There were no traces of Daniel Sylvester's seminal fluid on Alicia's clothes inside the bags that the police had found, so he was only charged with second-degree life deprivation. Neither he nor his lawyer agreed with this, as Sylvester claimed that his actions were unintentional. On October 7, 2005, more than 1,500 people attended Alicia Ross's funeral at Beth Emeth Bice Yehuda Synagogue in North York. New details of the case became known during the trial that began in April 2007. Sylvester admitted that he took the life of his neighbor, 25-year-old Alicia Ross. However, he insisted that he never wanted to harm her during the deadly struggle in the early morning of August 17, 2005. Sylvester allegedly was shocked when he realized Alicia had died. He tried to plead guilty to involuntary life deprivation. However, prosecutor Kelly Wright rejected his request, deciding instead to prove that the troubled young man with a history of anger and mental problems acted intentionally. And even if he did not initially intend to take Alicia's life, he knew that he was causing harm that could end with her death. She assumed that Sylvester attacked Alicia from behind as she was going from the backyard to her bedroom. Sylvester denied that his attack had any sexual motive or that he had any sexual urges towards Alicia, whom he did not know and with whom he had never spoken during the seven years they lived in the same neighborhood. He later confessed to a psychiatrist appointed by the defense that he thought Alicia was pushy and inconsiderate because she stared at his elderly mother two weeks earlier. Jurors heard that Sylvester had a history of voyeurism and was a peeping Tom from a young teenager right up to the time of his arrest. Moreover, he also admitted to being an excessive masturbator and that he would get aroused when he watched neighbors have sex through the windows of their homes at his family's cottage. Sylvester was adamant in his statement that he had no intimate contact with Alicia, either before, during, or after he attacked her. But during the trial, the jury learned that he had fantasies about attacking women. He told psychiatrists that his impulses were malicious because women in his school years humiliated him and called him a loser. Sylvester returned to check on Ross's decomposing remains at least 10 times over the next two weeks, before moving some of her remains to a forest area near his family cottage in Kobaconk, about three weeks after her death. The court also heard Sylvester had been treated for mental health issues since the age of nine, but stopped treatment in 2001 and became a recluse with little social contact other than his elderly mother. He saw numerous psychiatrists throughout his life, including one whom he told that he had experienced horrible thoughts of jumping out of bushes and raping. Alicia's boyfriend also testified at the trial. If we compare his testimony and Daniel Sylvester's strange inclinations, we can assume that the latter could have been aroused and attacked Alicia deliberately. Sean was one of the last people to see Alicia alive. He admitted that that night, before Alicia disappeared, they had intimate intercourse on her bed in her room, which had sliding doors overlooking the backyard and ravine behind the house. Considering that Sylvester liked to peek, he potentially could have seen Alicia and Sean together and have gotten aroused. Perhaps he waited for the right moment and attacked Alicia. Sean also told the court what he did after he got home. He said he made several frantic phone calls to Alicia after he returned home, the last at 12.27 a.m., but she never answered or returned his call. Sean also called the following morning, and when he couldn't reach her or anybody at her home, he went there and discovered a pair of sandals, a drinking glass, and a cigarette butt, all lined up in a row heading toward the backyard gate. He then called 911. York police thought the items looked suspicious, even thinking someone had staged the crime scene, but neither Hine nor Sylvester ever admitted putting the items there. Defense attorney David Hobson accused Sean Hine of placing the cigarette, the glass, and the sandals in the Ross family's backyard to create the impression that Sylvester had deliberately attacked Alicia. The jury also heard a recording of Sylvester's interrogation, where he tells the police that he went for a walk around 2 a.m. along the grassy path that separated his house from Alicia's, claiming they met there. Sylvester said she swore at him and asked what he was doing there. They briefly argued before Alicia called him a loser and told him to leave. After that, he attacked her. He spent the following days as if nothing had happened. He watched movies most of the day and then went to bed. 
He was surprised that the incident went unnoticed. I didn't understand how nobody could have seen me do this, he said. It took the eight women and four men on the jury less than four hours to come to a verdict. They found Daniel Sylvester, a social recluse who fantasized of assaulting women and spied on his neighbors, both from his family cottage and in his own neighborhood, guilty of second-degree deprivation of life. In July 2007, the court sentenced Daniel Sylvester to life in prison with no possibility for parole for 16 years. Sylvester showed no reaction when he heard the verdict, nor did his mother Olga. Alicia's mother, Sharon, bowed her head and cried. Her husband, Julius, put his arms around her and also wept, as did other family members in the courtroom. Sharon said the sentence would do nothing to diminish the loss of her daughter. It's a very bittersweet thing to hear a number, said Sharon. Although we were very glad to hear a murder conviction, nothing will bring Alicia back. Fortis called the past two years torture. According to her, she suffers from sleepless nights and sometimes feels that she's just waiting for death so that she can be with her daughter again. Alicia had everything worth living for. She had a family who loved her, a house she loved living in, a job she loved, and a new boyfriend. Busy planning her bright future and creating new opportunities, Alicia had no idea she was living so close to such a darkness as Daniel Sylvester. She didn't know him or the threat he posed. He entered her life in the middle of the night and ended it within minutes.